thank you very much. First of all, uh, thanks for uh, because this for me is the second time, the second year I'm uh, moderating this panel and it, was, it is a uh, uh, very interesting and, uh, uh, opportunity also for me to meet other, other uh, women, uh, younger and older ones. Uh, I think it's a very important uh, opportunity to listen to some stories, to some success story and to inspire you, inspire you so that you can uh, start soon to plan your career and try to reach your goals uh, and uh, in, in that you will not just reach your personal goals but the, I strongly agree on, on the fact that our society needs the best brains no matter if they are male or female so we need a stronger participation of women uh, to the economy and to the society. Um, so, today uh, I will uh, moderate this panel and uh, try to, uh, so I uh, would like to start asking to uh, our three guests, uh, let's say first a, a sort of a common question, that is, since they come from th three different uh, industries uh, that are, let's say, the, the business uh, uh, industry and the marketing field in particular, the consultancy business and the finance business, uh, what uh, is uh, her impression, their impression concerning the role of women in their specific field? So if, for instance, uh, there has been any change, any relevant change in the women, uh, in the role that women uh, run in their uh, specific field. So uh, I would start from... Uh, Okay, so thank you first of all to invite me. I'm very honored and happy to be here with you. Uh, I'm Swedish, you can see from my name, I'm not Italian, uh, but uh, I'm in Italy since 14 years and I'm with L'Oreal since 20 years. Started out my career in Paris and then went to New York and uh, then I came to Milano. So uh, what is the difference, what I've seen in these 20 years, uh, there's definitely a big difference. Uh, when I started, I started out with an idea in my mind. I definitely had a role model who was also my mother. Uh, I wanted to work uh, internationally. I wanted to work with uh, something which was pleasurable, brands. And I wanted to work uh, internationally, I just said. So basically, uh, my idea was probably Procter & Gamble. I came to France in Erasmus and I met with L'Oreal. People usually say, well, oh, that's so fantastic. You work in a female world. Actually, it was not so female. None of my managers were female, and uh, today it's very different. So I can say that we've come a long, long, a long way, uh, and I definitely see the difference. The difference is stronger in some countries than in Italy, but also in Italy we do have, we have come a long way. Um, so there is a big difference of the numbers. Just to give you an idea, I looked at the Eurostats the other day, and uh, in Europe, the managers is about one out of three in Europe. In Italy, it's one out of five. In L'Oreal, uh, in Italy, we actually have 30% of our COMEX is female. 44% of the brand man general managers, like myself, are female. So there's definitely a great step up. Um, so I think that, yes, there is a difference. Uh, I agree with uh, Monica, and I'm happy to hear that I'm not the only one thinking this, that there's still a lot of things to do. So yes, uh, gender issue is still there. For us in L'Oreal, it's not only about gender issue, it's actually about diversity. So today, in some areas, we talk about uh, quota azzurra, blue quotes, because some, some métier, some areas of work in L'Oreal are very female. Marketing is more female, human resources are more female, but there are definitely areas like controlling, like uh, sales, that are much more masculine. So I believe that we have to, moving forward, not think only about having managers, female managers, but where are they? Because it's much richer. The diversity, why do we believe in diversity? It's because when we have more differences around the table, the innovation is greater. And also the discussions are much richer. So I definitely believe that we have to continue the gender, gender issue and also on diversity in general. What's your experience, Christina? Uh, okay. um, so first of all, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, it's always a great pleasure for me to come back because I started everything, actually not exactly here, but in the other building. And uh, I also did, uh, and I'm actually very proud uh, of being a DES alumni uh, because it's true, it's actually very general, but it's also very cool, I would say. 
So I'm, I'm still a sponsor and I always go back to the desk class actually to, to try to uh, let's understand the desk people what's the business because nobody knows it. But anyway, uh, since then a lot of course happened. I, I started actually, I continued my career a bit in the university space and then afterwards I joined the Merrill Lynch world. Uh, then I went to McKinsey, I went out McKinsey uh, for a couple of years and then I joined back my firm as a partner. And um, I want to start with, um, with an interesting message, I think. For me, personally, I never, and it's very honest what I'm saying, I never had any single problem for being a woman, or I didn't perceive any single obstacle in my career for being a woman, because, and I reflected a lot about this, um, because I think the factor that um, supported me a lot along my career was that I had a very strong drive. Very strong means <laughs> very strong. And um, I wanted to like, do everything for achieving what I call impact. Um, of course, this comes with a lot of, somebody would say, sacrifices or um, determination to just put your work in the first place, at least in the first, I don't know how many years of your own career. Uh, but what I wanted to do um, was to establish myself as a recognized professional. This is something that I want to give you as a piece of advice because I really believe that you need to start from building a reputation for yourself, which is very similar to what, you're, to what we were saying before. You need to like, find the set of qualities that makes you perceived as unique. Because if you are perceived as unique, people will always need you and not just a general professional or manager. Um, so this is, I think, like the positive side. Of course, um, the society is not necessarily my experience. And um, this is also the reason why now that I am in the position in which I am, I want to do everything for changing the world for the next generation. Believe me, the words that I'm saying are not just like words just by chance. I really believe that we need to change the world for the next generation, which means that in my organization, I do everything for making our hiring strategy completely different from the past. Uh, I do everything for involving my partners in a, an overall discussion on diversity. We have a global committee discussing these things and putting the priorities on what we need to do to increase diversity, actually, not necessarily uh, gender diversity, of course, because we are a global company. Um, and I do believe that given that I am based in Milan and that I love my country, uh, nurturing our talent in, in, in the next future will mean uh, also creating an environment for which we give fair chairs to both genders. As simple as that, which means tons of things. Which means that we need to invest, for example, on growing girls in a different way. Uh, this is not the case because I have experiences in, in also my daily life as a like, woman or as a person that there are so many like small little biases in our societies, not necessarily at work, I'm talking about society and I'm talking about Milan and not talking about a small countryside like village. I'm talking about Milan uh, for which women are not considering to have the same chances as men. So all in all, I have a positive message. So it can also be the case that you are not, not discriminated at all in your career. I am, in a way, an example. Um, but there are not the structural conditions for this to happen 
structurally in our society. So I think that is the role of the people that are already leaders to change this. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm very glad to be here as well. Uh, I graduated in Nambokoni in uh, 1995, so a long time ago. This building was not there at the time, so it's uh, very, very nice to be here today. Uh, after university, I had different ideas uh, compared to what I do now. I uh, joined a company in controlling, then I did uh, a bit of auditing, and then I joined uh, 20 years ago Mediobanca here in Milan. Uh, at that time, uh, there were no women in uh, responsibility position. Uh, there were just most of them secretary, assistant, or back office, uh, middle office, or staff, not front office. Um, I remember when I was very young uh, going to meetings where there were all men and nobody was even looking at me. Uh, but soon enough, I realized that if you have something interesting to contribute to the, co to the conversation, uh, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're young, if, if you are women. I mean, after that, everybody is going to consider you and to take advice from you. Uh, the same day, in the same meeting, I remember when I, when I arrived, um, a guy from another bank, a senior guy, asked me if he could have a coffee. So it's like Monica. And I said, yeah, perhaps you can ask to the assistant sitting there. So uh, I never care about this. Um, after many years, I think the situation it's a bit changed. Uh, when I joined, uh, also just to give you an idea, uh, every girl, women in the bank, in the telephone list had a lower case in terms of uh, uh, initials, while every man had uppercase. So it was already, if you want, a diversification and a discrimination. And on top of that, all the assistants or the young people had different business card compared to the dirigenti, so the managers. Um, of course, now it's pretty much different. I mean, the, everything has disappeared in terms of this kind of list, this kind of discrimination. I'm still the only women in a, a woman in a responsible position, but still there is one. <laughs> At that point, there was no one. And in my team, uh, over the years, I've been uh, promoting a lot of girls, very talented. Um, I was telling to the other colleagues, I've got around 40 uh, people around Europe in, our, in different offices, and 46% uh, of them are women. This is the only team in my bank where uh, we have a such percentage of, uh, of girls. In the other teams, it's like 5%, 10%, so it's pretty much low and in low position. So I think it's, it's a very important when you have example and you have women in, uh, in such position, uh, because you can also give the possibility to the, to the, to the young girl that are really very, very much talented to, to grow and uh, uh, to, uh, to become uh, a, a, next generation of leader in, uh, in your organization. Thank you very much for your, for your answers. Uh, Ulrika, uh, I would like to ask you, since you mentioned the fact that you spent, you had different, uh, let's say, period in different cultures, okay? And um, uh, so I just would like to ask you if you experimented different approaches to uh, let's say, the, the role of women in different cultures and how could be useful, for instance, for a young uh, woman or man to uh, get in touch with different uh, uh, cultures mm. in order to, to understand the, 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 the different Yes, I, I think that first of all, what I noticed, and actually I'm now listening to my colleagues, I would say, um, I always had the feeling of, like, I was traveling in time because when I was young and my mother was one of the women of the 80s, one of the few new managers working with big teams, who was a role model for me, that's what I had in mind as when I was growing up. I didn't really know what I wanted to do exactly, but I kind of wanted to be a big manager. Um, then I came to France and I kind of lived the same. You know, all the managers that I saw, few women, they were women of the 80s. Uh, Few of them, they had to be very hard working, work more than the men, not always so much mm, taking care of the younger women to make them grow, but being very happy being on their own as well. Then I went to the US, 
in the US, uh, New York is not the US, but in New York, I was still kind of in the 80s in a certain sense. It didn't really change so much. Uh, and when I then went to Milano, I was like, oh my God, but I am still in the 80s and I've been traveling for like 10 years now and I am still in the 80s. So it's almost like I've been traveling in time backwards, staying still in the 80s. Fortunately, I do see a change. So it is changing. Uh, but what I would say to young girls, what they should be observant about is um, leadership styles. What is expected of you? Because in France, it was expected of me to be confrontational, to be able to discuss and be very assertive and enjoy having almost like a war going on in the conference room. Uh, for a Swede, that's quite different. We like consensus. We don't want to raise our voice. If you are angry, that's not well seen. I seem to have a colleague from the north up there. Somebody's smiling, no? <laughs> German, okay. So, of course, for me, this confrontation was a little bit of a shock, but if you understand that it's actually, they're enjoying it, it's not, not about the emotions being out there, but it's a strategy of how they use this approach. Uh, you have to be good at repartie. What does that mean? You have to take your share of voice when you're around the table. If you're sitting back like a good Swede listening and laughing with, they're not going to see you. So I think it's really what Monica was saying before, you have to make yourself notice. So you have to understand in what context you're being, because if you're going to travel around the world and you're most, many of you are international, you kind of under, have to understand where you're at and where you want to go and how you can use that context in your best and for the bad guys you want to bring in the best appropriate way. Uh, in the States, I was told uh, that I had a two French management style. So from being Swedish consensus, I had become French because in the States, you definitely don't do that. It's very political, I would say. Uh, you have to be on time. In France, it doesn't matter, really, not on the agenda. Uh, however, you can stay as long as you want in the meeting. It can finish also at 10 o'clock at night, as long as you finish the issue. Uh, in the States, basically, if the issue is treated or not, it's not so important, but it's important to be there five minutes above time, ahead of time. And then you can adjourn and do another meeting and maybe you will solve the question later on. In Italy, it's uh, not a country, it's a continent, it's in Europe, but we have everything. And uh, that's also very interesting, so it's a very challenging, different way of being. Um, I think that the social pressure on women in Italy is extremely hard. Um, so I think that we have to take a responsibility as women, and I very much enjoyed hearing somebody being so com like, uh, combative or like, really strong about it. Because in Italy it's a little bit bad to be emancipating, it's a little bit bad to be feminist. I actually stopped being a feminist for a while because I thought it's better I, I stop talking about these issues because nobody wants to listen anyways. I've become a feminist again. And I think that's actually, it's only about a feminist. What does, it, what does it mean? It means that you want to have the same opportunities for everybody. It's not about only good opportunities for women, but it's actually that women, like men, uh, yellow, black, red, everybody needs to get the same opportunity. That's what it's about. So I think that women in Italy have a very big responsibility. And I will give you an example, which I find very explaining. I have a colleague of mine, she has my age, she's from south of Italy, might be because of this, but it's not, it doesn't have to be. I often hear her complain about how men are um, so masculine, they decide everything and uh, we women don't get the part, the right part, etc, etc. And then we talk children and she's so proud of her younger kid, a guy, who is being birikino, a rascal, who doesn't do what he's supposed to be doing, who behaves anyway, who is shouting and screaming, and I can hear how she's enjoying it when she talks about it. And I'm like, but that's the guy who is shouting at you in the meeting. If you will be working for this guy in the future, how can you talk about this like this? I mean, you sh I'm a little bit more Swedish in my opinions, have him, like, have him shut up, have him put in the dishes in the dishwasher, just like your girl. That's the right opportunity for both of them, because both learn, they have to collaborate, 
and his wife will be much happier, will have a much nicer career than if you continue to raise him like this. So I think that we really have to be aware of where we are navigating and what we can do to make a difference. And how we work with our women, uh, collaborators, peers, don't be afraid of the competition, embrace it. The more we are, the better it gets. Thank you. Um, Christina, uh, I, I read from bi your bio, biography that, uh, that you have a daughter, I think, and uh, just give us some, some uh, experience, tell us about your experience in, uh, let's say, combining such a, such a hard work with the family management. So, um, then I want to go back to the leadership styles because I have a story to tell. But um, regarding my, my sweet devil, Margot, she's now three, or three years and um, um, everything is a mess. I mean, <laughs> I, I always say things are going super well with our family uh, because she's smiling and she's excited to live and bite the world. Of course, not everything is under control every single day, not at all. But this, I, I knew since the beginning that I would have had to basically accept it. Um, in my like, professional slash personal life, uh, regarding maternity, I, I felt a pioneer um, because I was actually, um, I discovered to be pregnant when, um, um, so when I was, uh, so I was out of McKinsey for two years because I was the head of the staff of uh, the Inter San Paolo CEO at the time, Enrico Cucchiani. I got to know I was pregnant when he decided to fire himself. So he just went to the board and say, you know what, I go. And I said, okay, probably I will not have a job anymore uh, the day after. But anyway, uh, I, dis I discovered I was pregnant at that. And then I continued to work there, et cetera. But then I decided I wanted to change my career because I, I was not buying the projects of the bank anymore. So I wanted to, um, to not necessarily go back to McKinsey, but I want to explore other opportunities. So, and I was pregnant, by the way, uh, quite visibly at the moment. And uh, so I, I went out for looking for another job. Um, and, uh, I mean, it went <laughs> very well, actually. And I started the process to go back to McKinsey as a partner, which is, by the way, kind of a painful process. Um, so I did all these things, and then um, Margot was born, and I started to work, like, when Margot was three months, um, as the first woman partner in the Milan office, first woman ever, basically. In, by the way, in corporate finance, uh, banking, basically. Um, I mean, it was tough at the beginning, nothing to say, but the ingredients of my success, I think, are that, um, first of all, I had a great role model calling, called Paola Biolchini, which is my mother. Um, she has always been working more than full time because she is an entrepreneur and um, she was always the authority, like the mother authority, my like confident mother. She was always there for me. I had never experienced any, any single problem in any possible psychological ways because she was working. So this means that I don't have any single problems with like being guilty or whatever. I think that Margot will like, grow very well, even if I'm not at home, and probably even better. Uh, because I'm also not like, necessarily the best child entertainment in this world. I'm, I'm not, okay. Mm. Um, second thing is that, of course, you need to be like, very, very aware of the balance of your couple. Uh, because if your partner is not supporting you and you're not supporting your partner, if you're not clear on what's your like, common idea of uh, the way you want to grow your family, then you will for sure uh, fail, for sure. 
because then there will be problems at home, you will not be able to just go at work and concentrate, etc. The third thing that I tell to everybody, not only to girls or to women, is that you need to have, I mean, it's a very practical and stupid thing, but it's the single thing that, it, that will count, you need to have a full-time support that helps you and for which you can say, I am always, always, always very, I mean, I can trust that everything is going well and it's under control at home and I don't have to like think about uh, the practical things of the day-by-day -day life of my daughter. If I have a meeting, if I have to prepare something, if I have to take a plane and go to London, I don't need to plan my agenda, my work agenda, and, and I can't say no to go to London, to Athens, to New York, whatever, because I don't know where to put Margot that night. I mean, this is something that can't go, at least with my job, impossible. Um, so, I think the other thing is that you need to like, be very confident about yourself and try to also change the perceptions or the social pressure uh, that would want you to be something else because you are what you are and you decide the way your life needs to go. For the rest, what I always say, um, I am sure that it works. I am sure that it works. You need to be strong and uh, talk about your like moments of weaknesses. Try to solve it with the people you love and the people you believe that are really the ones that support you. Thank you. Um, Maria Teresa, uh, since uh, you, uh, let's say, you, you based all your career in, in the finance field, uh, I would like to ask you uh, first, uh, let's say, a question devoted to the specific industry. That is, many of you probably remember that uh, after the financial crisis, uh, Christine Lagarde said that if uh, Lehman Brothers would have been Lehman's sister, the crisis probably would have been uh, different or probably wouldn't uh, even happen. Um, my question is, um, is it, uh, from your point of view, let's say, um, do, you, do you agree with such, uh, uh, which, uh, with this thinking, uh, that is, women in finance are really so different in terms of mentality, in terms of risk appetite from men working in the finance field or not? Well, I think that in, if you take women in, uh, uh, with a responsibility and you compare with the men, there is no much difference. I mean, in terms of uh, uh, what happened to Lehman, I think it's not a matter of, of men or, or women. There were a lot of mistakes made by the, the CEO of the bank in premise, I would say, uh, but not, not only him. Uh, so, uh, even if I compare the young, uh, the young girl with, uh, with boys, I mean, they are very uh, conscious of their capabilities, they are ready to take risk, to put them in front of the clients, even if they are very young. So there is not much difference in terms of attitude and uh, behavior, I would say. Thank you. And is there something that, uh, then starting from your experience, uh, let's say, uh, already Monica told something about that, but women could do better in order to, let's say, grow up in their career. She, she spoke, she's I think that Monica that. covered perfectly this part uh, in her speech. Uh, I also agree that women should uh, ask more. Uh, I always have to say that uh, in my career, I was never afraid to ask. Uh, my father was my example and he always told me, you need to ask, otherwise you will never get there. And uh, for me, that has been uh, a continuous uh, path in my, in my career. Of course, if, if I compare to some of my colleagues, they are much more aggressive, so they ask much more, much more money, uh, so I cannot be compared to them. But at least I've never been afraid to ask for a promotion, for an upgrade, for a, a, an increase in salary. And uh, I experienced exactly what Monica said when I started to have a team and responsibility, uh, when there is uh, the, the promotion time or the discussion on a bonus, uh, 
every boy in my team comes to me and say, okay, you, need what? you know what? I think I deserve a promotion, I deserve to have more money. Uh, and there is no one in, uh, in my team, or almost no one, uh, even though they are, they are changing because I encourage them to ask, they came to my office and said, I want this, I want that. So I agree with Monica, you don't need to be afraid to ask. Uh, you, you need to be uh, conscious of, uh, of your competencies and uh, just go ahead. Thank you. Um, uh, we, we already, uh, again from Monica, heard about mistakes and failures that all of us, we, we do. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, to Ulrike, what's your, let's say, what has been your uh, reaction to failures? Let's say, how did you, could you, help, uh, could you manage that? Well, and what are your suggestions, let's say? I have to admit, I hate to fail. That's the first thing. I don't like to fail. I'm a little bit of a perfectionist. But moving forward, I have learned to become a little bit less professionist because I have seen around me all these guys moving much faster and going more quick and dirty and actually works as well. So um, what I really try to do is to learn from mistakes and I think that's very banal, but it is true. Uh, when you do make a mistake, there's always something good that you can take out of it. But try to make it systematically. Like, already, I'm sure you've done a hundred mistakes. I had done already millions of mistakes at your age. So try just to go around it, not being embarrassed about it, because it is embarrassing to talk about failures. But try to understand, in your off-site maybe, what could I have done differently? So that next time, I won't make the, right, the same mistake. So what I try to uh, communicate with my team is that it's okay to fail, because if they are afraid of uh, daring to take a decision, I have to take the decision, and I don't want to take all the decisions. So as a manager, it's very important to make people dare, to take, to be empowered, to propose, and to make them move forward. What well, only thing I ask them, don't do it again. Let's try to understand what went wrong, and let's not do that mistake again. Do other mistakes, but not the same. So that's a little bit my philosophy, and I think it works. Uh, I ask people, and my feedback is actually that, yes, we are not afraid of failing, uh, but it is important not to do it again. Thank you. Mm. Um, well, all of you uh, now have a leadership position, and as such, you also lead and guide groups, teams of people. So I would like to ask first to, to Christine and then also to Maria Teresa, what are the, the, the key ingredients you use to lead, to, to team, let's say, the group, of the, the group work you manage? So um, I work in, in, in a company or in, 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 in a strange organization that is um, um, actually founded on teams and on uh, leading teams and on like giving teams the opportunity to solve problems basically. So it's kind of like very central to my own value proposition to understand and to improve my leadership style and the way I, I kind of raise my set of talents. Um, it's a source of energy for me and I invite all of you in, in really taking this piece as a like, value in, in the set of things that you will uh, um, use to shape your development path. And it's basically, I think, starting from listening to the people that are working with you and like collecting a genuine feedback. The genuine feedback from the people that are working with you sometimes is um, complex to handle. Sometimes if there is this genuine feedback culture, um, they can tell you things that are hurting because um, you're not perfect. And even if you're a good leader, in, in, when you're dealing with great talents, they will always try to find a way to improve you. And it's actually more than fine, and actually is a mean for improving, if you really listen to what your people are saying to you. Um, I use this a lot. 
I, I really believe that having a group of followers that really trust you passes from the fact that you are listening to them. And um, the other thing that is very, very important, actually is crucial, is to learn how to listen to yourself, which means that it's very much likely that you shape your leadership style at the beginning in the way your organization is pushing you to become. Uh, while as you grow as a professional or as a manager, you need to dare to push your own leadership style in, let me say, in, in the ingredients, because then you can really also add specific uh, things for which the people are liking you, not only as the professional, but also as a person. The very specific example I have to share with you relates to like, my personal evolution. When I, when I started uh, uh, in McKinsey, I was uh, actually working with, uh, with the corporate finance team and I was just a junior associate. Um, and um, at the time, the, of course, not only, not only the leadership, but also all the others were men. And, um, and in particular, the head of the corporate finance unit was a very macho man. In the end, oriented also in promoting female uh, like kind of profiles, but very macho. Vincenzo Tortorici, for uh, who, like, <laughs> the, the persons uh, who know him. Um, the guy was just telling to me, literally, um, now that you became a consultant, you're not a woman anymore, you're just carne da macello for me. But it was just, I mean, I'm telling this to, to you because his leadership style was that one in that moment, and I'm still a close friend of him, so it's not that he uh, brutalized me so much. But, I mean, this was the starting point, right? And um, after a while, after I gained his trust and uh, the, the trust of the other guys, everybody was calling me uh, Soldato Catania. So I was kind of, you know, <laughs> literally uh, working like a soldier, which has positives and negatives. The positives for me was that I was not making mistakes, that I was really like focused, delivering, etc. The other aspect, which is the big cons, is that I was not having kind of my own identity. I was just a soldier. Mm. When I started to uh, gain, I decided that I had to change this. I decided to push my personality forward. And um, I believe that this was really the, like, I don't know, one of the uh, important changes in my career because I really went with Cristina in front of clients uh, discussing my point of views, not necessarily the point of views of like my analysis, etc. Um, Maria Teresa, what about you? That is uh, also in um, uh, concerning the, the the style. Let's say, do you think there exists, uh, let's say, a women's style in teaming in uh, in managing groups uh, or? Uh, I think it's important when you have a responsibility uh, to lead by example. And again, I don't think it's a matter of being a woman or a man. Uh, you need to, uh, to be able to take difficult decisions in, uh, uh, in certain situations. Uh, you need to be uh, transparent, share the strategy with the team, uh, discuss with them the objectives, the performances. Uh, in some cases, uh, I've been uh, more than once uh, in front of people that were not good for that job. And of course, you, can, you do not discover that immediately, but every, uh, every year, uh, if someone is not up to speed to grow to the next level, uh, there, there must be a change. And most of the time, people do not realize that. So again, you need to take difficult decision and 
uh, either fire people if they are senior or encourage to move the others. Uh, in my in my uh, in my team, we are. I mean, it, it's in any case, it's a small bank, so the competition is very very tough. And what I always tell to to the people working with me is that we need to be better of the uh, better than the others. It's the only way uh, in which you can uh, uh, go in front of a client with smart ideas and uh, and get uh, from their mandates and uh, recognition. And um, uh, I think, again, it's uh, being a leader, a good leader, is a day-to-day -day job, and it's not a matter of sex. Thank you. Uh, I have a last question for uh, all of you before opening up the, let's say, to the question from the public. Uh, that concern mentoring, that is, uh, you already maybe say something, but uh, just to, 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 to put it clear, uh, did you have any mentor in your career? And what is your uh, opinion about the relevance of having mentor uh, activity uh, starting from the beginning of the career uh, as well? Well, I don't think we are from the generation when mentoring was a big thing. Uh, and it's also a cultural thing. I think it comes more from Anglo-Saxon culture to do these kind of things, uh, coaching, mentoring. I truly believe in it. I think it's a fantastic, uh, very strong instrument and I would love to be in your situation to have the opportunity to apply to Mentors for You. I think it's a great initiative. I'm one of the first fans in L'Oreal with uh, meeting with Stefania. So it's a great, great initiative. Um, when it comes to myself, my mentor, my first mentor, and maybe only mentor because I never had one, is really my mother. I think it's a question of role models more in my generation. My mother was my first one. And then seeing bosses, some of them that I thought, I don't want to be that guy or that girl, or uh, that's the way I would like to be perceived. So that's kind of a passive mentoring, I would say, that I've been learning by listening, observing, and uh, living the experience. In my own uh, way of, of leading, uh, I've always believed that I position myself as a coach. Uh, it's uh, probably a little bit more from where I come from as a culture. A leader in, in Sweden is not the one who has all the answers. It's probably the one who has least answers, but it's the one who is able to put around the table the answers with the people who have actually the answers. So it's much more about pulling together the right team for the right strategy, for the right goal, and it's very different. So that's been a little bit of a difficulty for me in a certain way, uh, because I never worked in Sweden. So I always thought, when will it be my time to be able to really bring that on board? When will they understand that this is the way things will work better? So I feel very much millennial, to be honest. And uh, I think I've always been a little bit ahead of my time in my leadership, and uh, I've always had very good appraisals from my, from my team. Uh, because I think that they've, heard, they've felt like I listened, especially the girls, they've probably felt that I've been pushing their self-confidence. I've always uh, tried to take out the good girl syndrome in my girls, because I often see how our upbringing, and I am victim of it myself sometimes, I'm not saying I'm uh, vaccinated from it, but it's the fact when you work in a team, you have to get something done. You have a teamwork at school, my, my daughter just did it and she did the same good girl syndrome. You have to get the task done, and since you're so determined you want to have it good and well done, etc., etc., the girls kind of focus on getting it done. Then the guys, they are watching, sitting by, and what they're actually doing is that they have a different strategy of time. And I think this is something, is a concept I would like for you to remember. Uh, when I heard this the first time, I was like, eye-opening. And today, I try to remember it. It's the question of taking that time off during any project in your life and thinking of, how am I spending my time? Am I doing it on instead of somebody else, so I am not delegating? Uh, am I doing the thing that actually will make my project become the best? Am I being ready for what I need to communicate or do I just have a fantastic slideshow? It's probably much better to have the right message, the right body language, and know what you're supposed to be doing in the meeting than having the best slideshow. So for me, it's a lot about uh, probably mentoring, coaching, asking questions, 
sometimes I give advice and I say, like, oh, stop doing that because actually I'm not, I don't want to clone myself. I want to ask questions to have people, my people, get where they need to get, not where I want them to get. So, um, yeah, it's more, probably more of an inverse experience, but I love doing it and uh, I hope I will be working with Stephanie on this uh, great project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe just, uh, just a couple of words on this. Uh, I very much share what you said. I would have loved to be a mentee at, uh, at my, like in, my, in the first steps of my career. Um, I actually love to be a mentor. I really love to be a mentor. And I invite you to use um, the, the relationship where you, you have with your mentor in, in a very authentic and even provocative way. Try to test your, like, the more, like, the most strange questions that you have in your head and use the mentor to test the answer. Because I think that the, I mean, the, the experience of somebody who at the beginning doesn't know you, but uh, can see something of the movie of your potential next steps, uh, can really be used to shape an alternative path, which is not necessarily the one that you will choose, but is like the, the potential alternative way, the one after you take the sliding door in a different way. Um, I had, so I had a couple of experiences in, in, in mentorship and the times we had this special communication, I think it went fantastically. I, like the, the last time it happened was with, uh, with one of my mentees that was clearly disappointed with the first job she took. And, uh, and she, she was frustrated, but she didn't want to leave the brand. Uh, but actually, in that brand, that was not the job that she was expected. So basically, she was struggling, and she, she didn't know what to do. And so basically, we started to play this, this game. And she, I mean, she realized that there was no, nothing wrong to look or to search for another job, a better one. And actually now she's working for an hedge fund in London, not a big name, but a big investor. And, and she's growing a lot and she's extremely satisfied by this. So I invite you really to like, grasp the ground on, on this experience because I, I really believe that is, uh, uh, a great possibility that you have. Uh, then another thing, which is slightly different, but I think it will help you a lot as well, as soon as you will start your career, proactively look for sponsors, because the sponsors will be the catalysts for the speed and the success of your careers. Without sponsors, nobody goes anywhere. And the most successful managers, executives, professionals are the ones that are like winners in looking for sponsors. Very cool. And um, Maria Teresa, uh, did you have uh, any mentor when you started in your career? Uh, not really, uh, but as I mentioned before, my model has been my father. Um, is an engineer and he joined a company in the defense sector close to where I, I was born. It is Carrara, it's a small, it's a small town in Tuscany. And uh, after years, he became the CEO of the company. Uh, he has been there as a CEO for uh, many years and then became chairman. And when I was a kid, I didn't, know what I, I didn't know what I wanted to do uh, as a grown-up, but I, I knew I wanted to, uh, to become like him. I wanted to be independent in terms of, as Monica said, being able to, to buy a, a Gucci bag if you want and don't ask anybody. And I also wanted to travel like him because at the beginning of his career, he was always uh, around. Uh, now I do travel pretty much every week. I've got a, a suitcase that is ready and uh, in five minutes just it's uh, uh, prepared, 
Um, and also something else that I learned from him, apart from the, 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 the lesson that I mentioned already, is that it's not really um, how much time you spend with your fathers or if your kid or with your kids, but it's the quality of the time spent. Because at, the, at that time, he was really always traveling in, uh, uh, in US, in South America, so he was never home. But when he was there, it was really, for me, it was the top. So I think it's important to have uh, at least one model in your, in your life. Uh, now, probably it's easier to have a mentor than when I started my career. So I encourage you uh, to, to look for someone and to not be afraid to ask again, because uh, in my experience sometimes, uh, mentees are just are passive or just are there sitting and uh, think that, uh, believe that there could be uh, uh, conversation very uh, you, uh, helpful for them. But if you do not <laughs> act proactively and you, you, don't, you do not um, help your mentor, it's not easy to establish, a, 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 I would say, a, a useful uh, path for, for both of you. Uh, so again, don't be afraid. <laughs>